Hello, good morning everyone. New study today. New adventure in God's Word. You know, so join us today on the Bible bus. My hair needs a cut. <laughs> Gotta have some fun in life, haven't you? A bit of a laugh at yourself too. Okay, we're going to look at the book of Jonah. And look at some historical facts. We're going to do, today we're going to concentrate mostly <coughs> on the background of the book of Jonah. I got two different sets of notes that I'm going to be using. One of the sets of notes I'm using is from the Life Application Bible, King James Version. Okay, so some of the notes that I'm using won't be my own. And I'll also be reading from the TTB.org through the Bible Network, written by the late J. Vernon McGee. I can't think you could see that back to front, but... The Book of Jonah through there. There's lots of notes and there's lots of reading to be done today. So let's pray first. Lord, we ask you to help us as we go through this new Book of Jonah. We thank you, Lord, that it's a beautiful day out there. And later we can go out and enjoy being out in your presence, enjoying your creation. I pray that you'll bless us as we study this book together. In Jesus' name. Amen. Right, to start... I'm going to read from the Life Application Bible Introduction to the Background of Jonah, okay? And there's a lot in the J. Bernard McGee notes that I didn't know about and what time in history. We'll, we'll go through it slowly. Right, let's read what it says in the introduction to the chapters on this. Sin runs rampant in society. Daily headlines and overflowing prisons bear dramatic witness to the fact. With child abuse, pornography, serial killings, terrorism, anarchy and ruthless dictatorship, the world seems to be filled to overflowing with violence, hatred and corruption. Reading and hearing about these tragedies, and perhaps even experiencing them, we begin to understand the necessity of God's judgment. We may even find ourselves wishing for vengeance by means upon, by any means upon the violent perpetrators. Surely they are beyond redemption. But suppose that in the midst of such thoughts, God told you to take the gospel to the worst of the offenders. How would you react? That's a very good question, that is, isn't it? You know, I'm not reading from the notes now. You know, how would we react if God sent us to work in the prisons or sent us to work on the streets where there's anarchy going on there is in some places you know you know so let's continue jonah was given such a task assyria a great but evil empire was israel's most dreaded enemy the assyrians flaunted their power before god and the world through numerous acts of heartless cruelty so when Jonah heard God tell him to go to Assyria and call the people to repentance, he ran in the opposite direction. How many of us do that when God calls us and asks us to do something? We pretend or we think, oh, was it really God or was it my own thoughts? We make all the excuses under the sun not to do what God has told us to do. The book of Jonah, let's go back to the reading. The book of Jonah tells the story of this prophet's flight and how God stopped him and turned him around. But it is much more than a story of a man and a great fish. Jonah's story is a profound illustration of God's mercy and grace. Lovely enough. No one deserves God's favour less than the people of Nineveh. A serious capital. Jonah knew this, but he knew that God would forgive and bless them if they would turn from their sins and worship him. Jonah also knew the power of God's message, that even but knew that God would forgive them, they would respond and be spared. But even though through his own work preaching, they would respond and be spared God's judgment. But Jonah hated the Assyrians. And he wanted vengeance, not mercy. So he ran the other way. How often do we run away from God when God is speaking something to us or he's convicted us of something? 
to how often do we run the other way? Yes, though we're going to need to consider that one sometimes. Eventually, Jonah obeyed and preached in the streets of Nineveh, and the people repented and were delivered from God, from judgment. Then Jonah sulked and complained to God, I knew that thou art a gracious God, and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. In the end, God confronted Jonah about their self-centred values and lack of compassion, saying, And should I not spare Nineveh, that great city wherein are more than sixty six score thousand per sixty thousand people that cannot discern between right hand and their left hand and also much cat and also much cattle as you read Jonah see the full picture of God's love and compassion and realize that no one is beyond redemption the gospel is for all who will repent and believe begin to pray for those who seem to be farthest from the kingdom and look for ways to tell them about God. Learn from the story of this reluctant prophet and determine to obey God, doing whatever he asks and going wherever he leads. It's a powerful message in the book of Jonah. And, uh, you know, we can be exactly like that and we can run away from the plans and purposes of God for our lives because we want a cushy, easy life. But God is looking for obedience to his word and his sacrifice. He's looking for some better than more than sacrifice. He's looking for obedience. Excuse me. So where do you stand today? Have you heard the call of God? We've spoken often on the call of God on our life. And this is a call that God was given to Jonah to go and preach this message to these particular people. We don't hear an awful lot about Jonah in the scripture, but as we study later on, you will see more of where Jonah is mentioned in other parts of the Bible. Write your statistics, purpose, to show the extent of God's grace of the message of salvation is for all people. Jonah was the author, son of Amittai, original audience, the people of Israel. The date written approximately 785 to 760 BC. The setting, Jonah preceded Amos and ministered under Jeroboam II, Israel's most powerful king. Uh, 793 to 753 BC. See Kings 14, verse 23 to 25. Let's look for that now. Second Kings... Second Kings. It's good to read a bit of background to see where Jonah's mentioned in the Bible, in other parts of the Bible. So, you know, that, that you can check it out then to make sure that what you're reading is correct. Second Kings 14. Second Kings fourteen, and we're looking at twenty-three to twenty-five. Jeroboam the second ruler rules Israel. In the fifteenth year of Amaziah the son of Joash, king of Judah, Jeroboam the son of Joash, king of Israel, began to reign in Samaria, and reigned forty and one years, and he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. He departed not from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. So that was Jeroboam the first, who made Israel to sin. He restored the coast of Israel from the entering of Hamath and to the sea of the plain, according to the word of the Lord of God of Israel, which he spake by the hand of his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet, which was of gath Hepher. For the Lord saw the affliction of Israel, that it was very bitter, for there was not any shut up, nor any left, 
nor any helper for Israel. So there we see it's in the, the reign of Jeroboam the second. Interesting, yeah. And I like looking at the dates and having a kind of an idea. Nineveh repentance must have been short-lived, for it was destroyed in 1612 BC. A key verse in the book of Jonah, and should not I spare Nineveh, that great city, wherein, he are, wherein are more than six score thousand persons, we read, that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand. So 60,000, six score, no more than that again. A score is 20, so six twenties, six, two, six, two, 120, but are more like 120,000, I would say. People, not 60,000, like I was saying. Key people, Jonah, the ship's captain and the crew. Key places, Joppa and Inaba. This book is different from all the other prophetic books because it tells the story of the prophet and does not centre on his prophecies. In fact, only one verse summarises his message to the people of Nineveh. Chapter 3, verse 4. Jonah is a historical, narr is, is a historical narrative. It is also mentioned by Jesus as a picture of his death and resurrection. Matthew chapter 12, let's have a look at that, Matthew chapter 12, Matthew 12 and verse 38 to 42, it's very important we do a background, we can understand what the message is that's going on in the Bible and we understand some of the historical facts and other things you can check out that happened around that time. It's of, it proves that the Bible's dating system and that is correct when you look at these things. Matthew 12, verse 38 to 42. Religious leaders asked Jesus for a miracle. There, then certain of the scribes and other Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. But he, said, and, and he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. And there shall no sign be given to it, but the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah, Jonas is called the other Jonah, was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the people. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation, and shall condemn it, because they repented at the preaching of Jonas. And behold, a greater than Jonas is here. Yeah, so that's the passage that shows that Jesus we mentioned him. So you know, there are lots of different reasons why we we mentioned that chapter, and as I begin to read some of the notes from here, and that's through the Bible by the late Jerry Vernon McGee, you'll get a clearer understanding. I hope because I did when I read it. In Jonah, in the book of Jonah, the Achilles heel of the Bible, this is what J. Vernon McGee said, it is, if we are to accept the ridiculous explanation of the critics, the translators of the Septuagint were the first to question its reasonableness. They set the pattern for the avalanche of criticism that was to follow. The ancient method of modernism is to allegorise the book and to classify it with Robertson Crusoe and Gulliver's Travels. Have you ever read any of those? I have read them myself. Some of the extravagant theories of the critics are more far-fetched and fantastic than they even concede the book of Jonah to be. For example, this is what the critics say. Different, different camps on it, different people. Number one, it is held without a scrap of evidence that Jonah was the son of the widow of Zarephath. Okay. Two, there is a theory that Jonah fell asleep during the storm, had a dream, and that the book of Jonah is the account of that dream. The third critic say, there are those who relate the book of Jonah to the Phoenician myth of Hercules and the sea monster. Four, 
It is claimed that Jonah was picked up after the storm and shipwreck and storm and shipwreck by a boat that had fished for a figure had a fish for a figurehead, which gave support for the record in the book of Jonah. The five point the critics make is other resort to the wild claims that a dead fish was floating around and that Jonah took refuge in it during the storm. <laughs> what nonsense is that is, isn't it? The producers of these speculations claim that the book of Jonah is unreasonable and they bring forth these theories to give credence to the story. We must dismiss them all as having no basis on fact, no vestige of proof, from a historic standpoint, and are only in existence in the imagination of the critics. I like that. That's true. The writer of this book is the book is Jonah. Jonah was a historical character. We've just read this read about that now, so you know, we we'll go over that again. The historical record of the kings of Israel and Judah is accepted as reliable. No one denies that David Josiah and Hezekiah were real kings and it is among these records, the records of these kings that we find the mention of Jonah. Speaking of Jeroboam the son of Joash, the historian writes, writes He restored the borders of Israel from the entering of Hamath unto the sea of the Arabah according to the word of the God, Lord God of Israel which he spoke by the hand of his servant Jonah the son of Amittai, the prophet, who was of gath Epha, 2 Kings 14.25. We just read that. Jeroboam was a real person. Israel was a real nation. Hamath was a real place. And it is unlikely that Jonah, the son of Amittai, was a figment, figment of the imagination. It is beginning the point to say it is beginning the point to say that this is another Jonah. It is not reasonable to believe that there were two Jonas whose fathers were named Amittai. That's very unlikely. And two Jonas with the fathers named Amittai in there, and whose officers were prophets. This is especially evident when it is observed that the name is not a common one, and it only occurs in one reference. In this, only in this reference in Second Kings two, uh, 14 and 25. In the book of Jonah and in two references in the Old Testament. We read one of them. Obviously the Lord Jesus was Christ considered Jonah a real person. And he accepted the record of the book of Jonah as true. Listen to him. For as Jonah was a sign unto the Ninevites. So shall also the Son of Man be to this generation. Luke 11 verse 30. And another one is, we read this as well. And he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it, but the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, a greater than Jonah is here. Matthew 12, verse 39 to 41. If you reject the book of Jonah, you are not merely saying that you can accept the record as reasonable, but you do not believe that Jesus was acquainted with the facts of the case. So if you doubt in the book of Jonah, you doubt in the words of Christ to say himself. That's what the Chamber of McGee is saying, and I tend to agree with that. You break with Jesus when you deny the book of Jonah. The fact that the question has been raised concerning the authenticity of jo jo Jonah's record is all the more startling when a, when a contrast is made with one of the other minor prophets. For instance, there is no reference to Habakkuk in any historical book and he is never mentioned by name in the New Testament. In spite of all this, there is no, concert, there is no concerted effort 
to class him as a mythologi mythological cre character. Of course, the real reason for getting rid of Jonah is to get rid of the miraculous experience that he records concerning himself. Interesting to have a look at what other people think about what the book of Jonah did. Conservative scholars place the writing of this book before 745 BC. The incidents took place about that time. Some even place it as early as 860 BC. It seems best to place it between 800 and 750 BC. Students of history will recognise this as the period when Nineveh was in its heyday. The nation of Assyria was at its zenith at this time. Also, it was destroyed by 606 BC. By the time of Herodotus, Nineveh, the city of Nimrod, had ceased to exist. When Xenophon passed the city, it was deserted. But he testified that the walls still stood and they were 150 feet high. Historians now estimate they were at least 100 feet high and 40 feet thick. Who some strong walls, eh? Take some getting through them. Comments the author's book, uh, Jonah, Dead or Alive. I suppose you should be able to get that from ttb.org if you want to get the author's book. Uh, that's um, J. Bernie McGee from ttb.org. I'm not paid to say that, but I've had permission to use these, re these notes in my recordings. The book of Jonah is experience, not prophecy. In examining the book of Jonah, we find that it contains the personal record of an experience that Jonah had, and he evidently was the writer. Properly speaking, properly speaking, the brief brochure is not a prophecy and seems to be out of step among the minor prophets. It contains no prophecy, although Jonah was a prophet. To me, reading that bit there, it talks about, you know, makes me think of prophets who preach as well as prophesy. You know, without a, without a, without a preacher, the message can't be heard. Without a prophet, the message can't be heard. As the narrator, he told of his experience, which was a sign of the greatest event in the history of the world, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The book of Jonah is not a fish story that disturbs a gainsaying world, but it is a throne in the midst of which stood a lamb as though it had been slain. Revelations 5 6. This lamb is a resurrected lamb, and a Christ rejecting world will some day cry out, Hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne, and from the wrath of the lamb. Revelation 6 16. It's because they didn't want to believe it, and when they did see it, when it does, when Jesus does come and sits upon the throne in judgment, they will want to hide then, because they refused to believe while they had the opportunity, and now they're face to face with them. They'll be face to face with Jesus Christ on the throne. The fish is not the hero of the story. We hear so much about Jonah and the whale and the swallowed by the whale and all of that, but that's not the the hero of the story. There's another salient point to keep before us as we study this book. The fish is not the hero of the story, neither is it the villain. The book is not even about a fish. The chief difficulty is in keeping a correct perspective. The fish is among the props and does not occupy the star's dressing room. Let us distinguish between the essentials and the incidentals. I like that point. The incidentals are the fish, the gourd, the east wind, the boat and the river. The essentials are Jehovah and Jonah, God and man. Significant subjects. This is the book, this is one of the books of the Old Testament that set forth the resurrection. Those who assert that the resurrection is not found in the Old Testament surely are not versed in the magnificent message of Jonah. When a wicked and adulterous generation was seeking after a sign, Jesus referred them to the book of Jonah for the message. 
As Jonah, so Jesus is the fine comparison made by our Lord. We like this study today. Um, we haven't even started the reading yet. Point two, salvation is not by works. Salvation is by faith, which leads to repentance. The book of Jonah is read by the Orthodox Jews on the day, Great Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. Kippur I can never speak. One great self-evident truth from the ritual of this day is that the way to God was not by works of righteousness, which we have done, Titus 3, 5, but by the blood of a substitutionary sacrifice provided by God. The most significant statement in the book of Jonah is in 2 verse 9, salvation is of the Lord. 3. God's purpose of grace cannot be frustrated. If Jonah had refused to go to Nineveh the second time, would God have destroyed the city? God would not have been limited by Jonah's refusal. He would have raised up another instrument, or more likely he would have had another great, another fish ready to give Jonah the green light towards Nineveh. The book shows God's determination to get his message of salvation to a people who will hear and accept it. That reminds me for that of uh, what we heard uh, before. If we give it a message to preach, we must preach it faithfully. If we refuse to preach it, the sin and the judgment that falls upon the people it will be our responsibility, be upon our head. But if we do it faithfully and we obey what God's given us to speak, then God will, will bless us but we have, because we have done what he asks us to do. God blesses faithfulness and obedience. Often we hear, we can hear a voice of God speak and say, go and do that or give this to that person. And we always have this question, I am too, is it God or is it me speaking? And sometimes we forget. We must obey what God says. Just like Gideon. Gideon tested God and he put out the fleeces. One night it, the fleece was wet and the ground was dry, and the next night the, the ground was wet and the fleece was dry. You tested God, and sometimes we have to ask God for confirmation. We must always, if we hear a prophetic word, and if it's personal, we ask God to give us confirmation, and God may often use two or three other methods of confirming his word to us. That's why we must... You know, obviously test everything, check everything out. But not like Jonah, oh, I'm not going there. I'm going to run away and I'm going to go the other way. I'm going to get on board ship and go somewhere else. I'm not preaching to those people. Not, that's what God is telling us to do, is to give a message. Of, you know, that if they repent, God will bring his blessing upon people. But, and four... God would not cast us aside for faithlessness. When Jonah failed the first time, God did not give up. The most encouraging words that a faltering and failing child and God can hear are, And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time. God is good and gracious. The most penetrating picture, this is point five, God is good and gracious. The most penetrating picture of God in the Bible is in Jonah 4 verse 2. It is wrong to say that he, the Old Testament reveals a God of wrath and the New Testament reveals a God of love. He is no vengeful deity in the book of Job. God wanted to show his mercy to the people. Point 6. God is the God of the Gentiles. It has been suggested that Romans 3.29 be written over this book. Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he all, not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. The book of Jonah is the answer to those, who crit, those critics who claim that the Old Testament represent, presents a local and limited deity, a tribal deity. The book of Jonah is a great book on missions and as a world vision. Yeah. That reminds me of another scripture that we read recently, where it's, uh, where if you look back, because I read the Bible 
cover to cover every 90 days or try to or listen to it on audible that i remember another scripture which says god will the jews were to be set up so that other nations could come to come to god uh something like that it goes see the per but the jewish the, the jews became self-seeking and look in inward rather than outwards and showing the love of God to the other nations around them. God used them as an example, but they often got full of pride, thinking we are the true God. The rest of the nations have nothing. They're just worthless dogs. You know, a Gentile is someone who's not a Jew, but Jews often used to think of all the other nations as dogs as worthless. But God's purpose was to bring all men to Jesus Christ. Approaches to the study of Jonah. Striking, whatever one, striking resemblance between Jonah and Paul. Both were missionaries to the Gentiles. Both were shipwrecked. Both were witnesses to the sailors on board the ship. And both were used to deliver these sailors from death. I hadn't thought of that one. There are other striking comparisons with a careful study will reveal. Paul made three missionary journeys, and with his trip to Rome there were four. The four chapters of the book of Jonah may be divided into four missionary journeys of Jonah. One into the fish, one to dry land, three to Nineveh, and to the and four to the heart of God. Two timetable approach. When you consult a timetable in a railway station or an airport, there are three important factors you note. One, destination. Two, departure time. And three, arrival time. It is possible to construct the four brief chapters of Jonah into the form of a timetable. Departure from Israel, Samaria or Gathepa. Destination in Nineveh. He arrives at a fish. Chapter one. Departure from a fish to Nineveh. Destination, the fish took him to Nineveh, to the shores, and he was landed onto dry land. Chapter 2, dry land. Destination, Nineveh. Arrival at Nineveh. Chapter 3, Nineveh. Departed from Nineveh. Destination to the gold vine. And arrive at the heart of God. Chapter 4, like that. Well, that's all. I've read all the notes. It doesn't go into a verse-by-verse -verse study in um, Jonah, but we will do that as we go along in the next few days or weeks or, or however long it takes. Let's look at a few more bits and then we'll begin reading. The Blueprint. Jonah was six his mission. Chapter 1, verse 1 to two ten. Jonah was a reluctant prophet given a mission he found distasteful. He chose to run away from God rather than to obey him. Like Jonah, we may have to do things in life that we don't want to do. Yeah, think of it as children. Our parents always wanted us to do things and we didn't really want to do them and we'll argue and we'll try and get out of our excuse if it was a chore in the house or it was a little job they wanted us to do or just to tidy our bedroom. Anything, but we will well, try every way to get out of what God wanted us to do. Uh, and our parents wanted us to do. And like God, God being our Heavenly Father, he really turned Jonah around into this. Like Jonah, we may have to do things in life that we don't want to do. Sometimes we find ourselves waiting to turn and run. Jonah fulfills his mission, we look at, in chapter 3, verse 1 to four eleven. But it is better to obey God than to defy him, or run away. Often in spite of our defiance, God in his mercy will give us another chance. So if you've failed to do the best, give the message God's given you, God will give you another chance. God can always use anyone else. It reminds me of where God, Jesus says, if, if you don't praise me, even I can raise up the stones to praise me. God could use someone else, but God has chosen to use you. He chose you before the foundation of the world for a specific work and to bring a specific message to people. 
Often in spite of our defiance, God in his mercy will give us another chance to serve him when we return to him. Yeah. Mega themes in the book of Jonah. Explanation. God's sovereignty. Although the prophet Jonah tried to run away from God, God was in control. By controlling the stormy seas and a great fish, God displayed his absolute yet loving guidance. The importance of that was, rather than running from God, trust him with your past, present and future. Saying no to God quickly leads to disaster. Saying yes brings new understanding of God and his purpose in the world. God's message to all the world explanation. God has given Jonah a purpose to preach to the great Assyrian city of Nineveh. Jonah hated Nineveh and so he responded with anger and indifference. Jonah had to learn that God loves all people. Through Jonah, God describes Israel of its own mission, reminded Israel of its own mission purpose. I was just discussing that with you wasn't I, before we read this. We must not limit our focus to our own people. God wants his people to proclaim his love in words and actions to the whole world. He wants us to be his missionaries wherever we are, whatever, wherever he sends us. Repentance. When the reluctant preacher re went to Nineveh, there was a great response. The people repented and turned to God. This was a powerful rebuke to the people of Israel, who thought they were better than, but refused to respond to God's message. God will forgive all those who turn from their sin. God doesn't honour sham or prestige. He wants the sincere devotion of each person. It's not enough to share the privilege of Christianity and think once we're Christians, we're Christians, that's it. We don't have to do anything more. We must ask God to forgive us and to remove our sins. Refusing to repent shows that we still love our sin. So is God trying to point a finger at an area in your life today? You know, where you're refusing to repent and you're pretending that God doesn't want you to do that and to stop doing a sin in a particular area. Refusing to repent shows that we still love our sin. So are we still in love with our sin or are we in love with Jesus Christ and his word and what he wants for our lives and recognising what he has done for us? God's compassion. God's message of love and forgiveness was not for the Jews alone. God loves all the people of the world. The Assyrians didn't deserve it, and neither do we. We've committed some awful sins in our lives. We don't deserve God's forgiveness, but God was willing to forgive even the Assyrians for all the things they did. The Assyrians didn't deserve it, but God spared them when they repented. And God will spare the nations of the world if they repent. He will... Spare us his wrath and his judgment if we turn, really repent and turn away from our wicked sins. But God spared them when they repented in his mercy. He's such a merciful God. God did not reject Jonah for abort in his mission. God had great love, patience and forgiveness. So if you have not delivered the message or done what God has asked you to do, God has given you another chance to do the things that he wants you to do what he's asked you to do. Importance. God loves each of us, even when we fail him. But he also loves other people, including, including those who are not in our group, in our clique, in our little crowd of people. God wants us to reach outside of that to other people, including those not of our group background, those who are brought up the same way as us, different race, whatever race, or Denomination, he wants us to be friendly to all the denominations, you know, because he wants to bring unity in his body, the church. Just because you're of one denomination doesn't mean you can't fellowship with somebody of a different denomination. You know, we must work together as God's people, wherever we are around the world, whatever background we have, whatever church we attend, we are one in Christ and we must work together as, as Christ's body. And that's what God wants for us. We accept his love, 
We must also learn to accept all of those whom he loves, even our enemy. We must love our enemies, do good to those who hate us. The Bible teaches us clearly. We will find it much easier to love others when we truly love God. Do we truly love God today? If we do, we'll obey his commands. <coughs> we will do what he's asked us to do. We'll begin by reading, but we won't go into a deep study of this. We may go back over it another day. Jonah forsakes his mission. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai. We know he was mentioned in Second Kings. We've learned that. We must keep that in mind. Saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it. For their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee from unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa and he found a great ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the pair thereof and went down into it to get with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Just pause for a minute there. Just looking at the map. But the Lord sent a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. We'll stop by there because this background is taking us uh, 40 minutes. Most people can concentrate for more than 20 to 30 minutes, some even less. So we'll try and look at this again in another broadcast. We'll continue with it. So I ask you today, has God given you a message to proclaim? Has he asked you to do something for someone and you've not done it? Well, it's still not too late. God can turn you around. He can give you a hard time over it. He can let you go through a bad experience or through a wilderness experience until you come to the end of yourself and turn to God and then obey what he's given you. You know, if you've got, God's called you to do something, he gives you a responsibility. You have to be faithful in that responsibility before he can take you on into another role or responsibility. I was listening to something on a mega man radio for a prophet was, was given a prophecy and he was saying you know that you know we, if we had the same gift every christmas the same thing every christmas it would get boring and monotonous but god gives gifts the gifts of the spirit and god doesn't want you to just stick with that one he wants you to grow in it and then go grow and mature and be used in all the gifts if possible i believe you can be used in all the gifts at different times in your life but I mean, you know, so, you know, God has given you something. But if you don't mature in that that he's given you, then he's not going to take you any further in your ministry. You know, your ministry will begin to get stale if you're only doing that. If you haven't grown into that and then matured into the things of God and then move on, you know. So, you know, you might be called to be a deacon. But God has another plan for you. But he wants you to be faithful in what you've been called to do. And when you are faithful in that and you show maturity, God will lead you into other areas of ministry. You know, it's just making me think of somebody that, you know, this is working for. So I pray God's blessing upon you. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you. And help that for your word today. Help us to not to be like Jonah. But even if we have been like Jonah, Lord, you give us another chance. And you keep on bringing us to our knees so that when we get up, Lord, you raise us up, Lord, and you lead us into new things and new ministries. Lord, we can't live in the past. We have to live in the day, looking towards the future coming of your kingdom upon the earth and your kingdom now. Lord, help us to be used now. In this world, in these difficult and dark times, help us to proclaim the message you've given us to give. Help us to pass that message on to others so that they may experience your great love and your great mercy and your forgiveness. 
Lord, I pray for those who will listen to this message, that they will be encouraged and blessed. Lord, that and, and you would equip more prophets and ministries, Lord, uh, you know, by you to listen to these broadcasts. That you will stop people on me, especially in my tracks too, Lord, and show me where I'm mistaken or where I have fallen, that I might walk in true righteousness, true holiness and true obedience to you. I pray a blessing now upon this word in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you guys. If you've enjoyed this message, please share it with others. I'm sorry it's been a bit long, but I think it's a good, you know, when you read something, to check everything out. Look into the background. Try it. See it. See. Try and find out more information if you can. Have a look on maps where things happened in the Bible days. I like doing that. I like to have some idea. I'm not very good at remembering dates and times like times in history. That's why it's good to have a guide alongside you or some notes that you can use to follow. So you get a good all-round picture so that we don't take the word of God out of context and we use it in the context which is meant to be. That means not taking from it and adding to it or anything else because we're told not to do that in the book of Revelations but so that we can understand it and walk before God. So God bless you this time. Make his face shine upon you. Be gracious unto you and give you his peace. Shalom. Amen. God bless you.